We are recording. Welcome back, Professor Jake. All right. Hello, everyone. Hello. I apologize about last week, but I had to get up to New York very quickly. And, uh, and uh, well, yeah. So it was a great trip. Got to see somebody as they got out of the surgery, and uh, it was all good. All right. So we are, let's see, we're in Idaho at this time, right on the border of, close to the border of Washington. And um, Charlie has had been having problems going to the bathroom. So Steinbeck, you know, kind of drugged the dog and relaxed him, but he's still concerned about him. So he's now going to drive him to the vet. So I am on page 129 at the bottom of my book, uh, which might not be the same as any of yours. I lifted him into the cab and drove hell for leather for Spokane. I don't remember a thing about the country on the way. On the outskirts, I looked up a veterinary in the phone book, asked directions and rushed Charlie into the examination room as an emergency. I shall not mention the doctor's name, but he is one more reason for a good home book on dog medicine. <laughs> the doctor was, if not only, pushing his luck but who am I to say he had a hangover? He raised Charlie's lip with a shaking hand, then turned up an eyelid and let it fall back. What's the matter with him, he asked, with no interest whatever. Well, that's kind of why I'm here, to find out. Kind of dopey, old dog, maybe he had a stroke. He had a distended bladder. If he's dopey, it's because I gave him one and a half grains of secanol. What for? <laughs> to relax him. <coughs> well, he's relaxed. Was the dosage too big? I don't know. Well, how much would you give? I wouldn't give it at all. All right, let's start fresh. What's wrong with him? Probably a cold. Would that cause bladder symptoms? If the cold was there, Yes, sir. Well, look, I'm on the move. I'd like a little closer diagnosis. He snorted. Look here, he's an old dog. Old dogs get aches and pains. That's just the way it is. I must have been snappish from the night. So do old men, I said, and that doesn't keep them from doing something about it. And I think for the first time I got through to him. Give you something to flush out his kidneys, he said. It's just a cold. I took the little pills and paid my bill and got out of there. It wasn't that this veterinary didn't like animals. I think he didn't like himself. And when that is so, the subject usually must find an area for dislike outside himself, else he would have to admit his own self-contempt. On the other hand, I yield to no one in my distaste for the self-styled dog lover, the kind who heaps up his frustrations and makes a dog carry them around. Such a dog lover talks baby talk to mature and thoughtful animals and attributes his own sloppy characteristics to them until the dog becomes, in his mind, an alter ego. If anybody ever wants to read uh, about that, Albert Camus, uh, in his famous existential novel, um, The Stranger, has a, in the beginning part, talks about a man who lives in his apartment complex in Algiers and how the man and the dog, after many years, have come to look and act exactly like one another. Such people, it seems to me, and what they imagine to be kindness are capable of inflicting long and lasting tortures on an animal denying it any of its natural desires and fulfillments until a dog of very weak character breaks down and becomes the fat, asthmatic, deferred bundle of neuroses. When a stranger addresses Charlie in baby talk, Charlie avoids him. For Charlie is not a human. He's a dog, and he likes it that way. He feels that he is a first-rate dog and has no wish to be a second-rate human. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. When the alcoholic vet touched him with his unsteady, inept hand, I saw the look of veiled contempt in Charlie's eyes. He knew about the man, I thought, and perhaps the doctor knew he knew. And maybe that was the man's trouble. It would be very painful to know that your patients had no faith in you. <laughs> 
So that's a, another what we call beautiful aside that Steinbeck does. It's only about you know a page and a half, but it's this masterful kind of little thing that happened. And and the thing is, he left out tons of little things that happened from this book because it's really only about two hundred pages. Um, but the things that he puts in there he wants in there for a reason. And this is one of those things. After Spokane, the danger of early snows had passed for the air was changed and mulsed <clears throat> by the strong breath of the Pacific. The actual time on the way from Chicago was short, but the overwhelming size and variety of the land, the many incidents and people along the way had stretched time all out of bearing. For it is not true that an uneventful time in the past is remembered as fast. On the contrary, it takes the time stones of events to give a memory past dimension. Eventlessness collapses time. I'm gonna read that again, because that's pretty deep. Um, he says, the actual time on the way from Chicago was short, but the overwhelming size and variety of the land the many incidents and people along the way had stretched time out of all bearing. For it is not true that an uneventful time in the past is remembered as fast. On the contrary, it takes the time stones of events to give a memory past dimension. Eventlessness collapses time. He's getting all into quantum physics, Stein. He's got, he's got so many interests. Dog bladders, quantum physics. <laughs> you know. All right, so now we're going to get closer to where you all are and see uh, if his experience of Seattle in 1960, 61, is similar to your experience in 2021. That's, that's a long time, 60 years later. The Pacific is my home ocean. I knew it first grew up on its shore, collected marine animals along the coast. I know its moods, its color, its nature. I feel that way about the Atlantic. It was very far inland that I caught the first smell of the Pacific. When one has been long at sea, the smell of land reaches far out to greet one. And the same is true when one has been long inland. I believe I smelled the sea rocks and the kelp in the excitement of churning seawater, the sharpness of iodine and the under odor of washed and ground calcareous shells. Such a far off and remembered odor comes subtly so that one does not consciously smell it, but rather an electric excitement is released, a kind of boisterous joy. I found myself plunging over the roads of Washington as dedicated to the sea as any migrating lemon. That is a wonderful paragraph <laughs> uh, about place and how somebody who's from the Pacific coast begins to feel back into that after going across the whole country. Hopefully he will not run over the coast like a lemon, but we'll do more. I remembered lush and lovely Eastern Washington very well and the noble Columbia River which left its mark on Lewis and Clark. And while there were dams and power lines I hadn't seen, it was not greatly changed from what I remembered. It was only as I approached Seattle that the unbelievable change became apparent. Of course, I had been reading about the population explosion on the West Coast, but for West Coast, most people substitute California. People swarming in, cities doubling and trebling in numbers of inhabitants, while the fiscal guardians groan over the increasing weight of improvements and the need to care for a large new state of indigents. It was here in Washington that I saw it first. I remembered Seattle as a town sitting on hills beside a matchless harborage, a little city of space and trees and gardens, its house matched to such a background. It is no longer so. The tops of hills are shaved off to make level warrants for the rabbits of the present. Y'all are rabbits. <laughs> the highway is eight lanes wide, 
cut like glaciers through the uneasy land. This Seattle had no relation to the one I remembered. The traffic rushed with murderous intensity. On the outskirts of this place I once knew well I could not find my way. Along what had been country lanes rich with berries, high wire fences and mile long factories stretched and the yellow smoke of progress, progress hung over all, fighting the sea wind's efforts to drive them off. So how do you feel about that? Has it changed much since 1960? <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> Your homework is, for that. now that was one paragraph. Your homework for next time is for each of you to write one paragraph about Seattle. There you go. This sounds as though I bemoan an older time, which is the preoccupation of the old, or cultivate an opposition to change, which is the currency of the rich and stupid. It is not so. This Seattle was not something changed that I once knew. It was a new thing. Set down there, not knowing it was Seattle, I could not have told you where I was. Everywhere frantic growth, a carcinomous growth. Bulldozers rolled up the green forests and heaped the resulting trash for burning. The torn white lumber from concrete forms was piled beside gray walls. I wonder why progress looks so much like destruction. Again, here's the kind of prophet of the environmental movement, of course, which he does not think of himself as. But now, of course, that's when he's first coming in. Again, we, we know that when he first goes into places, a lot of times the cantankerous Steinbeck comes out. He's all full of, you know, Piss and vinegar, to use it. Now, quote, now <laughs> um, but now the next day, it's going to be sunny. He's going to go out. He's going to drink some clam juice, and he's going to forget all about it. Next day, I walked in the old port of Seattle, where the fish and crabs and shrimps lay beautifully on white beds of shaved ice, and where the washed and shining vegetables were arranged in pictures. I drank clam juice and ate the sharp, crab cocktails at stands along the waterfront. It was not much changed, a little more run down and dingy than it was 20 years ago. And here, a generality concerning the growth of American cities, seemingly true of all of them I know. When a city begins to grow and spread outward from the edges, the center, which was once its glory, is in a sense abandoned to time. Then the buildings grow dark, and a kind of decay sets in. Poorer people move in as the rents fall and small fringe businesses take the place of once flowering establishments. The district is still too good to tear down and too outmoded to be desirable. Besides, all the energy has flowed out to the new developments, to the semi-rural supermarkets, the outdoor movies, new houses with wide lawns and stucco schools where children are confirmed in their illiteracy. <laughs> he does not have much faith in our public schools, confirmed in their illiteracy. The old port with narrow streets and cobbled surfaces, smoke grind, goes into a period of desolation inhabited at night by the vague runes of men, the lotus eaters who struggle daily toward unconsciousness by way of raw alcohol. Nearly every city I know has such a dying mother of violence and despair, where at night the brightness of the street lamps is sucked away and policemen walk in pairs. And then one day perhaps the city returns and rips out the sore and builds a monument to its past. The rest during my stay in Seattle had improved Charlie's condition. And I wondered whether in his advancing age, the constant vibration of the truck might not have been the cause of his trouble. That is an interesting thought, actually. All right, so now we're gonna leave Seattle. Quite naturally, as we moved down the beautiful coast, my method of travel was changed. Each evening, I found a pleasant auto court to rest in, beautiful new places that have sprung up in recent years. 
now I began to experience a tendency in the West that perhaps I am too old to accept. It is the principle of do it yourself. At breakfast, a toaster is on your table. You make your own toast. When I drew into one of these gems of comfort and convenience registered and was shown to my comfortable room after paying in advance, of course, that was the end of any contact with the management. There were no waiters, no bellboys. The chambermaids crept in and out invisibly. If I wanted ice, there was a machine near the office. I got my own ice, my own papers. Everything was convenient, centrally located, and lonesome. I lived in the utmost luxury. Other guests came and went silently. If one confronted them with good evening, they looked a little confused and then responded, good evening. It seemed to me that they looked at me for a place to insert a coin. <laughs> Somewhere in Oregon on a rainy Sunday, the gallant Rosinante bespoke my attention. This is a little interesting thing because he really hasn't talked much about the truck really um, throughout the thing. And the truck originally was spoken about a lot in the first chapter and you figured he would talk about it, but he talks more about Charlie and other characters, but not so much the truck. But now he's going to explain why he got all the way out to Oregon without talking about the truck. So somewhere in Oregon on a rainy Sunday, the gallant Rosinante bespoke my attention. I have not spoken of my faithful vehicle, except in formal terms of passing praise. Is it not always so? We value virtue, but do not discuss it. The honest bookkeeper, the faithful wife, the earnest scholar get little of our attention compared to the embezzler, the tramp, and the cheat. If Rosinante has been neglected in this account, it is because she performed perfectly. Neglect did not extend to the mechanical, however. Meticulously, I had changed the oil and attended to the greasing. I hate to see a motor neglected or mistreated or worked beyond its capacity. Rosinante responded to my kindness as she must, with purring motor and perfect performance. In only one thing was I thoughtless or perhaps overzealous. I carried too much of everything, too much food, too many books, tools enough to assemble a submarine. If I found sweet tasting water, I filled her tank and 30 gallons of water weigh 300 pounds. A spare container of butane gas for safety's sake weighs 75 pounds. Her springs were deeply depressed, but seemingly safe. And on hard pitching roads, I slowed and eased her through. And because of her ready goodness, I treated her like the honest bookkeeper, the faithful wife. I ignored her. And in Oregon on a rainy Sunday, moving through an endless muddy puddle, a right rear tire blew out with a damp explosion. <coughs> I have known and owned mean, ugly natured cars, which would have done this thing out of pure evil and malice, but not Rosinante. Has anybody ever owned a mean <coughs> car? <laughs> no. No mean-spirited cars, no? <coughs> it's interesting how he personifies so many things in this book. All in the day's work, I thought, <laughs> that's the way the ball bounces. Well, this ball had bounced in eight inches of muddy water and the spare tire under the cab had been let down into the mud. The changing tools had been put away under the floor, under the table, so that my total load had to be unpacked. Oh. The, new, the new jack, never used and bright with factory paint, was stiff and unruly, and it was not designed for the overhang of Rosinante. I lay on my stomach and edged my way, swam my way under the truck, holding my nostrils clear of the surface of the water. The jack handle was slippery with greasy mud, mud balls formed in my beard, I lay panting like a wounded duck. Interestingly enough, the University of Oregon mascot is the duck. I lay wounded like a duck, quietly cursing as I inched the jack forward under an axle that I had to find by feel since it was underwater. Then with superhuman gruntings and bubblings, 
And I'm going to take you back now to the beginning of this superhuman water. If you remember, he went out and secured his boat in the hurricane and then swam back in. And it was all this superhuman effort of being in the water here once again. So there's this metaphor of being underwater in the water during storms using superhuman effort that goes to his whole continuing narrative here. Then with superhuman gruntings and bubblings, my eyes starting from their sockets, I levered the great weight. I could feel my muscles tearing apart and separating from their anchoring bones. In actual time, not over an hour elapsed before I had the spare tire on. I was unrecognizable under many layers of yellow mud. My hands were cut and bleeding. I rolled the bad tire to a high place and inspected it. The whole sidewall had blown out. Then I looked at the left rear tire and to my horror, saw a great rubber bubble on its side and farther along another. It was obvious that the other tire might go at any moment and it was Sunday and it was raining and it was in Oregon. If the other tire blew, there we were on a wet and lonesome road having no recourse except to burst into tears and wait for death. It's a little dramatic. <laughs> and perhaps some kind birds might cover us with leaves. I peeled off mud and clothes together and changed to new finery, which got muddy in the process. No car has ever had such obsequious treatment as did Rosinante as we moved slowly on. Every irregularity in the road hurt me clear through. We crawled along at not more than five miles an hour. And that ancient law went into effect, which says that when you need towns, they will be very far apart. I needed more than a town. I needed two new heavy duty rear tires. The men who had designed my truck had not anticipated the load I would carry. After 40 years in the painful wet desert with no cloud by day nor a pillar of fire by night to guide us, we came to a damp little shut up town whose name escapes me because I never learned it. So there he's making a biblical reference to the exodus of Egypt by the Jewish people. Everything was closed, everything but one small service station. The owner was a giant with a scarred face and an evil white eye. If he were a horse, I would not buy him. He was a mostly silent man. You got trouble, he said. You're telling me. Don't you sell tires? Not your size. Have to send to Portland for those. Could phone tomorrow and get them maybe the next day. Isn't there any place in town that might have them? Well, there's two, both closed. I don't think they got that size. You're going to need bigger tires. He scratched his beard, peered long at the bubbles on the left tire and poked them with a forefinger like a file. Finally, he went into his little office, pushed a litter of brake linings and fan belts and catalogs aside, and from underneath dug out a telephone. And if ever my faith in the essential saintliness of humans becomes tattered, I shall think of that evil looking man. After three calls, he found a dealer who had one of the kind and size required. But this man was tied up with a wedding and couldn't tear himself away. Three calls later, he turned up a rumor of another tire, but it was eight miles away. The rain continued to fall. The process was endless because between each call, there was a line of cars waiting to be filled with gas and oil, and all this had to be done with a stately slowness. <laughs> a brother-in-law was finally aroused. He had a farm up the road a piece. He did not want to get out in the rain, but my evil saint exerted some kind of pressure on him. That brother-in-law drove to the two places far apart where the tires might be, found them, and brought them to me. In a little less than four hours, I was equipped riding on big, heavy-duty tires of a kind that should have been there in the first place. 
I could have knelt in the mud and kissed the man's hands, but I didn't. I tipped him rather royally, and he said, you didn't ought to do that. Just remember one thing, them new tires is bigger. They're gonna change your speedometer reading. You'll be going faster than the needle says, and you get some itchy cop why he might pick you up. I was so full of humble gratefulness, I could hardly speak. That happened on Sunday in Oregon in the rain. And I hope that evil looking service station man may live a thousand years and people the earth with his offspring. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. That's another aside. This book is just all asides almost. All right, back to Charlie. Now there is not any question that Charlie was rapidly becoming a tree expert of enormous background. He could probably get a job as a consultant with the Davies people. Now, does anybody know who the Davies people are? Mm -mm. No. You're muted, Steve. You're muted. <laughs> You're still muted, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> there is a tree service. They cut trees, trim trees. Oh, Davies. They uh, cut Davies. around power lines, that sort of thing. Oh, are they still in business? Oh, yeah. Yes. Some yeah. Of them. <laughs> okay, is it a West Coast thing? Uh, I think so. I don't remember a East Coast, but that was okay. a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, there we go. Um, but from the first, I had withheld from him any information about the giant redwoods. It seemed to me that a Long Island poodle who had made his devoirs to Sequoia Semper Virens or Sequoia Gigantia might be set apart from other dogs, might even be like that Galahad who saw the grail. So to break that down, if Charlie pees on a redwood, he might get a big head. <laughs> The concept is staggering. After this experience, he might be translated mystically to another plane of existence or another dimension, just as the redwoods seem to be out of time and out of our ordinary thinking. The experience might even drive him mad. I had thought of that. On the other hand, it might make of him a consummate bore. A dog with an experience like that could become a pariah in the truest sense of the word. <laughs> The redwoods, once seen, leave a mark or create a vision that stays with you always. So this is more of his beautiful place-based writing. No one has ever successfully painted or photographed a redwood tree. The feeling they produce is not transferable. From them comes silence and awe. It's not only their unbelievable stature, nor the color which seems to shift and vary under your eyes, no, they are not like any trees we know. They are ambassadors from another time. They have the mystery of ferns that disappeared a million years ago into the coal of the Carboniferous era. They carry their own light and shade. The vainest, most slap happy and irreverent of men in the presence of redwoods goes under a spell of wonder and respect. Respect, that's the word. One feels the need to bow to unquestioned sovereigns. I have known these great ones since my earliest childhood, have lived among them, camped and slept against their warm monster bodies, and no amount of association has bred contempt in me. And the feeling is not limited to me. A number of years ago, a newcomer, a stranger, moved to my country near Monterey. His senses must have been blunted and atrophied with money and the getting of it. He bought a grove of Semper Virens in a deep valley near the coast. And then as was his right by ownership, he cut them down and sold the lumber and left on the ground the wreckage of his slaughter. Shock and numb outrage filled the town. This was not only murder, but sacrilege. We looked on that man with loathing and he was marked to the day of his death. 
Of course, many of the ancient groves have been lumbered off, but many of the stately monuments remain and will remain for a good and interesting reason. States and governments could not buy and protect these holy trees. This being so, clubs, organizations, even individuals bought them and dedicated them to the future. I don't know any other similar case. Such is the impact of the sequoias on the human mind. But what would it be on Charlie? Approaching the Redwood country in Southern Oregon, I kept him in the back of Rosinante, hooded as it were. I passed several groves and let them go as not quite adequate. And then on a level meadow by a stream, we saw the grandfather standing alone, 300 feet high and with the girth of a small apartment house. The branches with their flat, bright green leaves did not start below 150 feet up. Under that was the straight, slightly tapering column with its red to purple to blue. Its top was noble and lightning riven by some ancient storm. I coasted off the road and pulled to within 50 feet of the godlike thing, so close that I had to throw back my head and raise my eyes to vertical to see its branches. This was the time I had waited for. I opened the back door and let Charlie out and stood silently watching, for this could be dog's dream of heaven in the highest. Charlie sniffed and shook his collar. He sauntered to a weed, collaborated with a sapling, went to the stream and drank, then looked about for new things to do. Charlie, I called, look. And I pointed at the grandfather. He wagged his tail and took another drink. I said, of course, he doesn't raise his head high enough to see the branches to prove that it's a tree. So I strolled to him and raised his muzzle straight up. Look, Charlie, it's the tree of all trees. It's the end of the quest. Charlie got a sneezing fit as all dogs do when the nose is elevated too high. <laughs> I felt the rage and hatred one has toward non-appreciators, toward those who through ignorance destroy a treasured plan. <laughs> I dragged him to the trunk and rubbed his nose against it. He looked coldly at me and forgave me and sauntered away to a hazelnut bush. If I thought he did it out of spite or to make a joke, I said to myself, I'd kill him out of hand. I can't live without knowing. I opened my pocket knife and moved to the creek side where I cut a branch from a small willow tree, a Y branch well tufted with leaves. I trimmed the branch edges neatly and finally sharpened the butt end and then went to the serene grandfather of Titans and stuck the little willow in the earth so that its greenery rested against the shaggy redwood bark. Then I whistled to Charlie and he responded amiably enough. I pointedly did not look at him. He cruised casually about until he saw the willow with a start of surprise. He sniffed its new cut leaves delicately and then, after turning this way and that to get range and trajectory, he fired. <laughs> I personally think his best writing is about Charlie Urinating. Uh, he has a fixation. Yeah, I've never known another person to, uh, to, to have such an awareness of his dog's, uh, you know, urination. Uh, <laughs> That said, if you're a good writer, you can make anything sound beautiful and descriptive and uh, interesting. So. All right. So how many of you have ever uh, peed on a redwood tree? <laughs> hey, there we go. I didn't know if it was a redwood tree or not. Oh, uh, you're like Charlie, you're an unappreciator. You gotta know what you're firing on, Steve. I did look up. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that sacrilege? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a good line, Steve. I do look up. I like that. <laughs> I stayed two days close to the bodies of the giants, and there were no trippers, no chattering troops with cameras. 
There's a cathedral hush here. Perhaps the thick, soft bark absorbs sound and creates silence. The trees rise straight up to zenith. There is no horizon. The dawn comes early and remains dawn until the sun is high. Then the green fern-like foliage so far up strains the sunlight to a green gold and distributes it in shafts or rather in stripes of light and shade. After the sun passes zenith, it is afternoon and quickly evening with a whispering dusk as long as was the morning. Thus time and the ordinary divisions of the day are changed. To me, dawn and dusk are quiet times. And here in the redwoods, nearly the whole of daylight is a quiet time. Birds move in the dim light or flash like sparks through the stripes of sun, but they make little sound. Underfoot is a mattress of needles deposited for over 2000 years. No sound of footsteps can be heard on this thick blanket. To me, there is a remote and cloistered feeling here. So he's kind of cloistered uh, yes. monasteries like Trappist yes. Cistercian yes. monasteries. So he's comparing it to a monastic silence. One holds back speech for fear of disturbing something. What? From my earliest childhood, I felt that something was going on in the groves something of which I was not a part. And if I had forgotten the feeling, I soon got it back. At night, the darkness is black, only straight up a patch of gray and an occasional star. And there is a breathing in the black for these huge things that control the day and inhabit the night are living things and have presence and perhaps feeling and somewhere in deep down perception, perhaps communication. I have had lifelong association with these things. Odd that the word trees does not really apply. I can accept them and their power and their age because I was early exposed to them. On the other hand, people lacking such experience begin to have a feeling of uneasiness here of danger, of being shut in, enclosed and overwhelmed. It is not only the size of these redwoods, but their strangeness that frightens them. And why not? For these are the last remaining members of a race that flourished over four continents as far back in geologic time as the upper Jurassic period. Fossils of these ancients have been found dating from the Cretaceous era, while in the Eocene and Miocene, they were spread over England and Europe and America. And then the glaciers moved down and wiped the Titans out beyond recovery. And only these few are left, a stunning memory of what the world was like long ago. Can it be that we do not love to be reminded that we are very young and callow in a world that was old when we came into it? And could there be a strong resistance to the certainty that a living world will continue its stately way even when we no longer inhabit it? This is Steinbeck at his best. I mean, like, He's just, this is beautiful. Like combining history of which he was a huge fan of natural history um, with his own, you know, musings in 1960 when all this fast food and chain stores and superstores and all these things are, are, are coming out and he's seeing more and more garbage everywhere and more and more people, more and more cars, factories. And here he's at his best when he's in nature every time. When second he gets around traffic in a city, he becomes a frightened <laughs> you know, snail who wants to go back into his shell, right? But once he gets out in the, along the rivers and the streams and the ocean and the whatever, he, he, his best comes out because he, he knows that and he feels a kinship with it that he simply does not feel with the city. He just simply does not feel the same kinship with the city. Uh, any, any thoughts on any of these things that we've read so far? 
Anybody, any thoughts about how you feel when you're in the redwoods or? Um... There's a recent book called Overstory by Richard Powers. Yes, yeah. It's a novel, but it really has a lot of, of factual basis. And it sort of speaks to this idea of, of beings which predate humanity and will be here long after humanity is gone. And uh, he uh, sort of presages that with his writing. He, he senses that. Uh, and Richard Powers' book is very powerful, kind of provides uh, some more scientific background to that. It's very interesting. Does he focus on a specific area? Well, the, yeah. like, well, the Northwest actually, okay. a lot of it's written about Oregon and Oregon in particular, but it uh, speaks to the idea of, of how uh, these trees have, are being abused, but we don't really understand the, the extent of their being. You know, they exist in lots of ways that we don't really sense. They, they communicate underground between their roots. It's just a, and there's a whole world up there that we don't even know about. He doesn't address that, of course, but uh, it, it's a fascinating book. I would recommend it to anybody who's interested yeah. in, in mm. the conflicts of ecology right now. Mm. Cool. And then there's also the German writer, The Secret Life of Trees, which mm -hmm. uh, talks about their ability to communicate with one another and to nurture and care for one another. So uh, Steinbeck was on to something that, that research is showing us is true. Yeah. yeah. And the, the name of that book is The Overstory by Richard Powers. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like Steinbeck had a real intuition back then. Um, and, and it's interesting because my college students, when they read this book, they're always amazed at so much of what he understood intuitively, um, you know, because he took this time to look. You know, that's another thing. You know, he took three, three and a half months to look. Um, and not everybody gets an opportunity to do that. And he got a chance to look and to slow down. And, and, and to look at the United States in a way that he, he's honest about in the beginning of the book, that he had, he had become out of touch with it. You know, he hadn't really, he'd been living in Long Island and he was a famous writer. And so he didn't really know what it was like anymore. And so this was a chance for him to get out there and reestablish a connection or a relationship with it. Um, and it turned out that a lot of his best writing in this book is about nature, and Charlie Ping, and, and, and he's very powerful with those two things. You know, human beings have, have had a sense of relationship with nature through animism long before there was any of the current organized religions. And I think it really speaks to how we respond when we're in nature, that it, if you open your mind to it, it really speaks to you in so many ways. I think yeah. he has that sense too. Yeah, and now as a person who studies and writes about place and its effects on us and our effect on it, we get into his biggest thing on place, which is going back to where he was born and where he was raised and seeing that. And it's, uh, for me, this is just uh, another wonderful part of the book for people who are into place studies. And we have about 15 minutes, so we'll be able to, I find it difficult to write about my native place, Northern California. Hello. It should be the easiest. I'm gonna to have to call you back, Lisa. Because I knew that strip okay. angled against the Pacific better than any place in the world. But I find it not one thing, but many. One printed over another until the whole thing blurs. And of course, you know, when we're reading this, you can think about where you were born. Um, he says, it's one thing over the other until the whole thing blurs. What it is, is warped with memory of what it was, and that with what happened there to me, the whole bundle racked until objectiveness is nigh impossible. This four-lane concrete highway slashed with speeding cars, I remember as a narrow, twisting mountain road where the wood teams moved, drawn by steady mules. They signaled their coming with the high, sweet jangle of hame bells. This was a little, little town, a general store under a tree and a blacksmith shop and a bench in front on which to sit and listen to the clang of hammer on anvil. 
Now little houses, each one like the next, particularly since they tried to be different, spread for a mile in all directions. That was a woody hill with live oaks dark green against the parched grass where the coyotes sang on moonlit nights. The top is shaved off. Remember he said that about Seattle too. Mm -hmm. The top is shaved off and a television relay station lunges at the sky and feeds a nervous picture to thousands of tiny houses clustered like aphids beside the roads. <laughs> that is a beautiful description. Yeah. <laughs> And isn't this the typical complaint? I have never resisted change, even when it has been called progress. And yet I felt resentment toward the strangers swamping what I thought of as my country with noise and clutter and the inevitable rings of junk. And of course, these new people will resent the newer people. <laughs> I remember how when I was a child, we responded to the natural dislike of the stranger. We who were born here and our parents also felt a strange superiority over newcomers, barbarians, forestieri, and they, the foreigners, resented us and even made a rude poem about us. The miner came in 49, the whores in 51, and when they got together, they made a native son. <laughs> that was the poem that the people sung about. And we were an outrage to the Spanish Mexicans and they in their turn on the Indians. Could that be why the Sequoias make us feel nervous? Those natives were grown trees when a political execution, ex okay, hold on. Those natives were grown trees when a political execution took place on Golgotha. They were well toward middle age when Caesar destroyed the Roman Republic in the process of saving it. To the Sequoias, everyone is a stranger and a barbarian. Sometimes the view of change is distorted by a change in oneself. The room which seemed so large is shrunk. The mountain has become a hill, but this is no illusion in this case. I remember Salinas, the town of my birth, when it proudly announced 4,000 citizens. Now it is 80,000 and leaping pell-mell on an, on, in a mathematical progression. I, I do, I wonder what the, um, there you go, somebody, Steve-O. Check what the population of Salinas is right now. That would be interesting. It was 4,000 back then, or it was 4,000 when he grew up. It was 80,000 back then. And he guesses it'll be 100,000 and perhaps 200,000 eventually. Even those people who joy in numbers and are impressed with bigness are beginning to worry, gradually becoming aware that there must be a saturation point and the progress may be a progression toward strangulation and no solution has been found. You can't forbid people to be born, at least not yet. Hundred and sixty-three thousand. Hundred and sixty-three thousand? Right. Wow. There you go. <laughs> I spoke earlier of the emergence of the trailer home, the mobile unit, and of certain advantages to their owners. And for those of you who have been on this journey, if you remember it, he dedicated a good six to eight pages on the mobile home and like really went into it. I had thought there were many of them in the East and the Middle West, but California spawns them like herrings. The trailer courts are everywhere, lapping up the sides of hills, spilling into riverbeds and they bring with them a new problem. These people partake of all the local facilities, the hospitals, the schools, police protection, welfare programs, and so far, they do not pay taxes. Local facilities are supported by real estate taxes from which the mobile home is immune. It is true that the state imposes a license fee, but that fee does not come to the counties or the towns except for road maintenance and extension. Thus, the owners of immovable property 
find themselves supporting swarms of guests and they are getting pretty angry about it. But our tax laws and the way we think about them were long developing. The mind shies away from a head tax, a facility tax. The concept of real property is deadly implanted in us as the source and symbol of wealth. And now a vast number of people have found a way to bypass it. This might be applauded since we generally admire those who can escape taxes, were it not that the burden of this freedom falls with increasing weight on others. It is obvious that within a very short time, a whole new method of taxation will have to be devised, else the burden on real estate will be so great that no one will be able to afford it. Far from being a source of profit, ownership will be a penalty, and this will be the apex of a pyramid of paradoxes. There you go, there's alliteration. This will be the apex of a pyramid of paradoxes. We have in the past been forced into reluctant change by weather, calamity, and plague. Now the pressure comes from our biologic success as a species. We have overcome all enemies but ourselves. Again, very prophetic, very prophetic, 1960. I mean, now the pressure comes from our biologic success as a species. We have overcome all enemies but ourselves. It's pretty good. When I was a child growing up in Salinas, we called San Francisco the city. Of course, it was the only city we knew, but I still think of it as the city. And so does everyone else who has ever associated with it. A strange and exclusive word is city. Besides San Francisco, only small sections of London and Rome stay in the mind as city. And this is where Steinbeck, I think, was sniffing blue because the next two lines, he says, are totally incorrect. New Yorkers say they are going to town. Man, I grew up on the opposite side of the Hudson River and all we ever said was the city, the town. Too much Elmer's up the nostrils. Paris has no title but Paris. Mexico City is the capital. Well, my wife's Mexican, that one's somewhat true. But no, we don't call New York the town. <laughs> Once I knew the city very well, spent my attic days there while others were being a lost generation in Paris. And here he's digging at the lost generation like Fitzgerald and Hemingway and Gertrude Stein. He's making a little dig there. I fledged in San Francisco climbed its hills, slept in its parks, worked on its docks, marched and shouted in its revolts. In a way, I felt I owned the city as much as it owned me. San Francisco put on a show for me. I saw her across the bay from the great road that bypasses Sausalito and enters the Golden Gate Bridge. The afternoon sun painted her white and gold, rising on her hills like a noble city in a happy dream. The city on hills has it over flat land places. New York makes its own hills with craning buildings, but this gold and white Acropolis rising wave on wave against the blue of the Pacific sky was a stunning thing, a painted thing like a picture of a medieval Italian city which can never have existed. And I will agree with him here as somebody who grew up across from New York. There is nothing to me in America like San Francisco when you see it, it's just such a beautiful city. I stopped in a parking place to look at her and the necklace bridge over the entrance from the sea that led to her. Over the green higher hills to the south, the evening fog rolled like herds of sheep coming to coat in the golden city. That's a very beautiful description. I've never seen her more lovely. When I was a child and we were going to the city, I couldn't sleep for several nights before out of bursting excitement. She leaves a mark. I'm going to, I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave off there because um, the next part is about him going to Monterey. Um, and Monterey is where his Republican sisters live, um, who he will fight with. And it's also <laughs> the bars that he used to go to as a young man where everybody still knows him. And so this is another really deep part of the book 
and it has a very interesting bar scene with very interesting language and symbolism uh, that reveals a lot about who Steinbeck was and who he is in the present. Any, any, uh, any uh, thoughts on, on the sections we read today? I've got a quiet group in the auditorium today. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're enraptured. That's okay. I think that's it is a good sign of the writing and the reading. Do you think that next week will be our last session? It seems like we have quite a bit of the book left. Uh, next week, no. Uh, no. Okay, I'll have to change uh, the publicity to say we're going through December thirteenth. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting there. We're we're on page uh, one forty five, and it ends on page. Let's see. There's a there's a there's a really hard section in here. Yeah, we're gonna need. I don't know. We might need three more. Three more. Okay. We can do that. Not, everybody, not everybody can vote for three more. I'll 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 raise my hand for three more. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, right. my edition of the book has some suggested readings, and one of them is The Hidden Life of Trees. Oh, nice. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah, we should finish right before Christmas, which, interestingly enough, um, we'll be reading about his Thanksgiving and Christmas. So, it'll kind of end with, with his ending. So, okay. Nice. All right. Well, thank you, and have a lovely week. We'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.